Dead America, Seattle, Part 2. Dead America, The Northwest Invasion, Book 4. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1. Day Zero Plus 23. Captain Kersey sat in his makeshift office, anxiously looking at his watch as the time approached one in the morning. Those planes should have been back by now, he muttered, and stood up. He paced back and forth, unable to stop himself from imagining the planes crashed and burning amidst a sea of undead runners, wearing the faces of his soldiers. They'd left a little less than an hour ago to drop off Sergeant Copeland and the Northern Blockade Group. A knock at the door ceased his nervous pacing. Come in, he said. David, his civilian geek tech specialist, entered the office carrying a mug of steaming coffee. Here, he said. Thought you might need a pick-me-up. These all-nighters can be a bitch if you aren't properly lubricated. Appreciate it, Kersey replied with a sigh, and took the ceramic mug. But given how run down this airport is, I'm a little concerned about the quality in this cup. David chuckled. Beggars being choosers, huh? He teased. The captain shared his laugh and raised his mug in a cheers before taking a small sip. Don't worry. I pulled it from a gas station in town, David said, leaning on the desk. Needed to stock up on energy drinks. Kersey nodded and then took a deep breath. Has... has there been any word on the planes? As a matter of fact, just heard from the lead pilot, David replied with a nod. They hit a headwind after dropping off the team, so they were delayed a bit. Should be landing in the next ten minutes or so. Kersey's stomach lifted a little at the news. How long to get them back in the air? he asked. I have the refueling truck on standby, David explained so it shouldn't take more than ten, fifteen minutes or so. The captain checked his watch, shaking his head with a frown. Barely an hour in and we're already twenty minutes behind schedule. Given that you've scraped together so much civilian aircraft and materials, it's a miracle these missions are happening at all, David pointed out. Kersey tilted his head back and forth and then took a sip of his coffee. This is true. David pulled a can of his energy drink of choice from his deep pocket and cracked it open with a whisht, toasting the captain before taking a long gulp. Do you have printouts for the Mercer Island mission? Kersey finally asked. David nodded as he swallowed his mouthful. Yeah, I handed them off to the sergeant leading that mission, he said. He asked if he could give them a look over before you address them. Guess I should look busy, huh? Kersey asked, scratching the back of his head. David smirked and shook his head. Nah, you're good, he replied. Perks of being a captain. They wait on you. Kersey smiled and took another thoughtful sip of coffee. He took a deep breath, steeled himself, and then headed out of the office to the hangar where the team was ready. What do you want me to focus on next? David asked, following him out. Corporal Bretz will be up at 0300, Kersey replied. Please make sure we have all the maps and plans ready for him. The tech specialist nodded. I'll make it happen, Captain he said and then headed off briskly for his work area. Kersey made the long walk across the airstrip, taking in the sight of numerous people moving in unison, making every preparation necessary. As he moved into the hangar, there was a group of men off to the side prepping their parachutes and gear. As soon as he got close, Sergeant McCarty immediately hopped up from his kneeling position and rushed over. Captain Kersey, he declared with a firm salute. I'm Sergeant McCarty. Ready to do battle for you, sir. Kersey returned the salute to the upbeat man. Thank you, Sergeant, he replied. I really appreciate you volunteering for this mission. When I heard it involved a rough terrain landing, I knew I was the man for the job, McCarty said with a sharp nod. The captain raised an eyebrow. Hopefully you can impart some of your experience onto this group, he said, motioning to the preparing soldiers. Because unless I'm mistaken, you're the only one who has made a rough terrain landing. Honestly, there weren't many of us to begin with, McCarty admitted. One of the fringe benefits of almost always having an overwhelming force is that you rarely have to get sneaky to land in a war zone. Kersey nodded thoughtfully. Plus, I'm sure it helped that the desert isn't exactly known for its lush forests, he added. Truth be told, the sergeant replied with a chuckle, I'd much rather land in the trees than suffer through another one of those summers. The captain clapped him on the back. Well, today is your lucky day, he said because you're getting your wish. Thank you, sir, McCarty replied, straightening his shoulders. Why don't you go ahead and pass out those maps, Kersey said, motioning to the cluster of papers in his hand. 
and we'll get started. The sergeant nodded and turned to his men, handing out the maps. All right, all right, he said as he moved. Listen up, the captain here is going to go over the mission objectives, and then I'm going to fill you in on everything else you need to know. He stepped aside, motioning to Kersey. Floor is yours, captain. The soldiers turned their attention on their superior, a few of them relaxing to study the island maps. Thank you, sergeant, Kersey said with a nod, and then raised his chin. Good morning, men. He waited for the murmured replies of the tired soldiers, and then continued. Today we have a top priority mission that is vital to the success of this invasion. What you are looking at on the map there is Mercer Island. Pre-war it was home to 26,000 residents, most of them wealthier than any of us could ever hope to dream of being. While their wealth brought them big houses in a secluded area, it didn't buy them safety from the apocalypse. He paused, clasping his hands in front of him. Satellite imagery shows that a significant number of the 26,000 residents have not only been turned, but they're out and about. And due to some plain maintenance issues, there are only going to be 30 of you going in to take them on. Hisses and whispers erupted throughout the soldiers, and McCarty's brow furrowed. Quiet down, he barked. Captain speaking. Kersey inclined his head towards him. Thank you, Sergeant, he said. I know the odds are stacked against you, and frankly, they're stacked against all of us. This invasion is a gamble, and if we don't take risks and pull it off, then everything is over. He crossed his arms. I hope each and every one of you understands that. There was a ripple in the affirmative, though the faces were still concerned. The captain did not hear you, McCarty barked. Yes, sir, the soldiers declared in unison. Kersey nodded to him and then addressed the men. If you will look at the southeast portion of your map, you will see a small forest circled, he began. This is your landing zone. People in D.C. have been monitoring this island for the last 24 hours, and this is the only place where there aren't huge congregations of zombies. Not going to lie. It's going to hurt. A lot, McCarty added brightly. Private Gilbert raised his hand, scowling deeply. Corporal Herrera grabbed his arm from beside him, trying to pull it back down, but Gilbert tore his body away and kept his arm staunchly in the air. "'What is it, Private?' Kersey asked, tone clipped. He couldn't help but still feel disdain for the ex-sergeant that had cost so many lives with his ego. Gilbert lowered his hand. "'Sir, with all due respect,' he said, raising his chin, "'why aren't we doing a water landing? Wouldn't that be safer?' Sergeant, would you care to take that one? The captain asked, cocking his head. McCarty shot daggers at the middle-aged soldier. Because, private, when you combine the amount of gear you will be hauling into battle with your complete lack of experience in water landings, half of you would drown, while the other half would wish you drowned, he replied, and then glanced back at Kersey. Sir. The captain raised an eyebrow. Does that answer your question, private? Gilbert frowned and lowered his gaze, nodding. Okay, just to the southwest of the forest you'll see a building circled, Kersey continued, holding up his own map. This is your rally point. It's a former country club, so the hope is that it'll be relatively deserted. First to arrive will secure the building, or if it appears to be too overwhelmed, secure a perimeter on the 18th green. From there you will split off into two teams. The bridge team will be tasked with working their way to this shopping complex in the north. He tapped at the area on the map, holding it up high so the men could see. To secure the trucks in the back of these two stores, it is a three and a half mile hike from the rally point, so this team will have to move and move quickly. McCarty nodded. I will be leading this team personally, he said, so whoever is with me had better be ready to keep pace. You will have the standard layout of 210 rounds, Kersey added, along with your melee weapons and sidearm so avoiding detection is going to be key to this mission succeeding. Once the trucks are secure, you are to proceed to the I-90 bridges to the east and west at the northernmost part of the island. You won't be able to plug them up completely, but the trucks should provide enough of a barricade to hold back the majority of the horde that will be coming from downtown and the suburbs. Private Dixon raised his hand, his eyes one of the only sets that were bright at the ungodly hour. Kersey pointed at him. Yes, um... He struggled to place the soldier's name. Private Dixon, sir, the young man replied. The captain nodded. Go ahead, he said. Sir, why not just blow the bridges? Dixon asked. Kersey shrugged. 
because someone with a much higher pay grade decided they wanted to keep him up, he replied. Fair enough, Dixon agreed with a firm nod. Now, the second team has a two-front mission, Kersey continued. Their first task is to clear the high school to the southwest of the country club. This one is going to be dangerous as the sports fields appear to be packed with zombies. The quieter you can do this, the better, because this is going to be a rally point for the reinforcements arriving by boat. He held up a hand. Which brings me to your second objective. About half a mile to the west are a string of docks that must be secured with the route to the school being cleared. As we speak, ship-based soldiers are departing for Vashon Island, which appears to be loaded down with the boats of people who were fleeing the outbreak in the early hours of this. Shortly after dawn, you can expect the first batch of soldiers to be arriving on the island, and they're going to need a place to stage. He raised his chin. Once the sun is up, your orders are to begin clearing the island of any zombie not secure in a structure. When this happens, it's imperative that the truck blockade is in place, because that noise is going to attract a lot of attention. Private Dixon raised his hand again, and Sergeant McCarty narrowed his eyes. Private, he barked. Kersey held up a hand to the annoyed sergeant to calm him down. It's okay, sergeant, the captain assured him. I'm happy to answer questions. What is it, Private? Sir? I think I speak for everyone here when I say we're going to do our job and whip some zombie ass on Mercer Island, Dixon began, lowering his hand. However, I think we'd all like to know exactly why we are going on what amounts to a suicide mission. I think knowing how we fit into the grand scheme of things would help to motivate us. McCarty crossed his arms, eyes blazing. Doing your job and surviving should be motivation enough, Private, he snapped. Private Dixon is right, Kersey cut in. It doesn't seem fair to drop you right in the thick of things, outnumbered eight hundred to one and not know why. Plus, it's not like we have to worry about the mission details falling into enemy hands. There was a ripple of chuckles, albeit nervous ones. Kersey took a deep breath, clasping his hands in front of him. In a nutshell, you are going to be turning Mercer Island into one giant decoy, he explained. Once it is secure, we are going to be moving in hundreds of men and equipment to drum up as much noise as possible, so that the zombies on both sides of the mainland will come to the waterfront. This is not only going to make life a whole lot easier when we start moving in the main force from the east, but will also greatly reduce the potential they get overrun by a massive horde. The soldiers glanced at one another, nodding in approval. Knowing some of these boys like I do, Dixon piped up, I can safely say we've all been called worse things than decoys before. The room erupted into laughter, with even McCarty cracking a smile. The roar of planes landing behind them cut through the air, and the sergeant raised a hand, whirling it above his head, snapping back into work mode. Sounds like our ride, boys, he barked. Let's start getting suited up. Kersey straightened his shoulders. Be safe out there, he declared. There was a loud, emphatic chorus in the affirmative and he gave them an appraising nod. He stepped to the side to allow them to get ready, but caught Herrera's eye and waved for him to come over. Yes, Captain, the corporal asked as he approached. Kersey leaned in, lowering his voice. Wanted to check with you and see how our problem child is doing, he asked. Gilbert? Herrera replied and shook his head. He's still pouting a little from being demoted, but he's doing what I tell him to. Might have a little lip behind it, but he complies. Kersey nodded, brow furrowed. You know if you have any issues with him. He let the insinuation hang in the air, and the corporal playfully gave him a finger gun. Don't worry, sir, Herrera assured him. He's put his last person in danger. The two men turned to see Private Dixon zipping around to the other men in the squad, helping them with their packs and giving words of encouragement, sometimes making them laugh. What do you know about Dixon there? Kersey asked. Herrera shrugged. Only been with him the last couple of days, he admitted. Seems capable enough for a grunt. Looks like he has the trust of the men, Kersey pointed out. Not an easy thing to get. The corporal smirked, a twinkle in his eye. I don't know. I found it to be pretty easy. Well, not everybody gets to beat down a superior officer after they endanger the unit, Kersey shot back, and they shared a small laugh. McCarty glanced over and pursed his lips. Corporal! Are you waiting on an invitation to join this excursion? He demanded. Because if you so require it, I can send a runner out to find a silver platter with which I can deliver one to you. Kersey waved a hand at the creative sergeant. That's my bad, sergeant, he admitted. Appreciate it, Captain, 
McCarty replied. Corporal, you will be riding in my plane so that we may have a talk en route. Herrera glanced at Kersey, who gave him a playful thumbs up in apology. The corporal scratched the back of his head and then walked over to get geared up. Kersey headed out of the hangar, looking at the planes being refueled before glancing back at the soldiers he was likely sending to their deaths. He took a deep breath, swallowing hard before heading back to his office. Chapter 2 The plane soared above the darkened landscape carrying the soldiers leading to what could be the last battle of their lives. In the rear plane, McCarty shifted and adjusted his headset, picking up a second one and handing it across to Herrera so they could speak over the loud noise. "'Can you hear me, Corporal?' he asked when his subordinate slid the headset over his ear. Herrera nodded. "'Yes, sir.' "'Good,' the sergeant replied. "'Now, from what I understand, you recently got a field promotion.' The corporal nodded again. Yes, sir. A few days ago, during the Spokane assault. McCarty looked him up and down and then raised his chin. Normally, I like having experienced men as my second-in-command, he began. But Captain Kersey seems to think you're up to the task despite your inexperience. I've heard other soldiers whispering about how you got your promotion, but I want to hear it from you. Not much to tell, really, Herrera replied, and inclined his head to Gilbert. The former sergeant here shit the bed— got a few good soldiers killed, and I had to step up. Is that all? McCarty asked, furrowing his brow. The corporal swallowed hard and lowered his gaze. I may have sucker-punched him and threatened to shoot him after his ignoring of the orders killed a couple of my friends, he admitted. McCarty cracked a smile. Well, I'd like to think if I pulled the same kind of nonsense he pulled, he said, you'd deal with me accordingly. You can take that to the bank, sergeant, the corporal replied firmly, meeting his superior's gaze. McCarty nodded. Good, he replied. I like having no-nonsense people working with me. He cocked his head and raised a finger. I am curious about one thing, though. What's that? Herrera asked. Why are you insistent on bringing him along? The sergeant asked. The corporal took a deep breath. Two reasons, he replied. One, I'm going to make damn sure he pays off his debts to the men whose lives he squandered. And two, McCarty raised an eyebrow. Herrera grinned. I get to push his ass out of an airplane. The sergeant chuckled, shaking his head. I look forward to seeing you in action, he said. The plane suddenly throttled back, startling most of the men, Herrera included. McCarty checked his watch before changing the channel on his headset to speak with the pilot. There's no way we're already at the jump zone, the sergeant said, turning to face the cockpit. Why are we slowing down? The pilot shook his head. Engine is running hot, so I gotta dial it back, he replied. Don't worry, we aren't going to be more than four or five minutes behind the others. Four or five minutes is an eternity in a war zone, son, McCarty warned. The pilot sighed. So is the four or five minutes it takes to crash land when the engine catches fire, he shot back. McCarty glared at him for a beat and saw it returned, so he backed down, knowing that he was right. He nodded in defeat. So, what you gotta do to get us there safe? The sergeant conceded. We'll make it work. He flipped the channel back to the corporal. We're good, just five minutes behind the others, which means we're gonna have to haul ass. Herrera nodded and then pulled his headset down, leaning over to the man on his right to tell him the situation right into his ear. That soldier then turned and passed it to the man next to him, and so on. Soon all the soldiers were nodding, accepting the news. The plane fell silent of speaking, with the men looking out the window at the moonlit ground, contemplating the task at hand. As they approached the jump zone, downtown Seattle came into view on the horizon, standing up tall. The moon reflected off of the glass of the buildings, as well as the space needle. Herrera noticed the concerned expression on McCarty's face, and his brow furrowed. He put his headset back on and asked, "'You good, Sergeant?' "'Yeah,' McCarty replied, shaking his head. "'Just hoping this goes better than that debacle we had in Kansas City.' The corporal felt his blood run cold. "'You were in KC?' he asked. "'I was,' the sergeant replied, "'along with a lot of other boys who didn't make it out.' Herrera swallowed hard. I'm sorry for your loss, Sergeant. McCarty turned his gaze on the corporal, 
all hint of concern gone from his stern expression. "'Just means we're going to have to kick their share of ass, too.' Herrera nodded firmly, giving him a thumbs up, wisely deciding not to press the issue further. Another few moments ticked by before the pilot tapped the sergeant on the shoulder. "'We jump in sixty! McCarty barked, voice carrying to the men clustered around. Herrera removed his headset and got the men ready, looking out the window to see the island coming up fast. It was big and dark, with patches of clear field and developments all around it. After a moment, he found the landing zone, an unmistakable dark patch on the southern portion of the island. The plane throttled back a little more, allowing them a stable departure. McCarty gave a signal and the corporal threw open the door to the plane. He stepped to the side, looking back at Gilbert, who bounced from foot to foot, psyching himself up to jump. Herrera reached out and grabbed his parachute shoulder strap, giving a heave to throw him from the plane, prompting a nod of approval from McCarty. The other soldiers piled out of the plane in short order, the corporal and sergeant jumping last. They plummeted through the air, hurtling rapidly towards the ground. At target altitude, they pulled their ripcords to deploy their chutes, the soldiers floating on the wind. At the slower descent, gunfire could be heard popping off sporadically on the ground. Herrera's heart skipped a beat with each shot that went off, worrying about just how bad it was on the ground. What if the woods were infested with ghouls? They could become living piñatas. Within a second or two, the hypothetical threat became real fear as the wind picked up strong gusts blowing them off course. He held on to his strap, struggling to control the descent, but it was no use. The wooded landing zone quickly became unreachable, as well as the rally point. The corporal looked below to see the soldiers who'd leapt first heading to the high school, careening out of control. At a few hundred yards above the ground, he realized that the majority of the ground was moving. He pulled as hard as he could on the parachute, trying everything he could to divert course. Two of the soldiers below were able to shift their descent to the right, crashing hard into the pavement of the parking lot. As they did, the dense mass from the field moved in their direction. Two other soldiers weren't as fortunate. As the wind had blown them too far off course, Herrera watched helplessly as they landed right in the middle of the field, quickly vanishing under a swarming mass of rotted flesh. Gunfire on the ground erupted coming from the two soldiers from the parking lot who'd managed to avoid an instant death. With the ground rapidly approaching, the corporal struggled to make the turn, getting just enough of it to land on the far edge of the parking lot. He tumbled forward, landing hard on the pavement, his chute dragging him across the hard surface. Moans came from nearby, too close for comfort, and Herrera looked up to see a swarm dozen strong grasping at the chute, tangling themselves up in it. He quickly pulled his knife and started hacking at the parachute lines, the horde growing closer and closer to him. Panic set in as they reached ten yards away, and he screamed as he soared at the cords. Gunshots rang out rapidly, striking several creatures in the head and dropping them. Herrera looked back to see Private Choi and Gilbert running up to him, guns blazing. "'What the fuck are you waiting on?' Gilbert barked. "'Get up!' Choi continued to fire as Gilbert helped Herrera out of his parachute. The corporal scrambling to his feet. The trio retreated a bit putting room between them and the horde. You all right? the ex-sergeant asked. Herrera nodded. Yeah, fine. Where are the others? Choi asked breathlessly. Where's Sarge? The corporal shook his head. Two of them landed on the field, he explained. I don't know about McCarty. A moment later, rapid gunfire erupted in the south, on the outer fringe of the field. They quickly rushed towards the noise, keeping their eyes peeled for trouble. About two hundred yards away, they spotted muzzle flashes going towards a slow-moving mass of rotted corpses. As they got closer, they spotted Sergeant McCarty, tangled in his chute cords that had woven in with a horde of zombies. They ran hard, raising their assault rifles as they went, and opened fire at fifty yards. The bullets weren't accurate, but they were desperate. At thirty yards, the mass got closer and closer to the sergeant, who struggled to free himself from the tangled mass of cords. He fired several more three-round bursts before his gun went dry, and the ghouls overwhelmed him. Herrera skidded to a stop twenty yards from the sergeant. "'What are you doing?' Choi demanded. "'We gotta save him!' The corporal shook his head, knowing it was too late. Choi let out a frustrated scream as they watched McCarty reach into his bag, 
pulling out a grenade and jerking out the pin with his teeth just as the zombies piled on top of him. The gruff sergeant didn't even scream as the ghouls ripped into his flesh. The trio of soldiers rushed away from the scene, not wanting to get caught in the shrapnel. As they cleared the area, a dull explosion sounded, countless bodies softening the noise of the blast. The corporal walked with determination into the neighborhood behind the school, the entire weight of the mission now on his shoulders. Chapter 3 Herrera, Gilbert, and Choi took a knee at the edge of a neighborhood, looking out over a golf course leading to the country club rally point. Choi kept a watch on the rear as the fighting through the neighborhood had been tough and consistent. I'm starting to think nobody on this island survived this, he muttered. Gilbert wrinkled his nose. And apparently everybody was having a picnic too, he spat. Haven't seen this many of those things out in the open since Spokane. Still doesn't change the fact we have to get our job done, Herrera said firmly. He scanned the golf course, seeing small patches of creatures making the plotting of the path through more difficult. I can't believe Sarge is gone, Choi groaned, scrubbing his hands down his face. What the fuck are we going to do now? Gilbert clenched his jaw. We're going to listen to the corporal, he said. He'll get us through. Herrera blinked at the ex-sergeant in surprise, and Gilbert gave him a confident nod. The corporal wasn't sure what had brought it on, though in the back of his mind he had a feeling the private knew they were in deep shit. If even Gilbert could see that, then he worried they were in the worst shape they could be. He shook his head, assigning his brain to the task at hand. We're on the move, he said. Follow close, melee kills only. We don't know what the situation is at the rally point, and until we do, I don't want any more attention to us than necessary. He stared at them expectantly. Good. Both privates nodded and pulled out their knives, and he led them out. They ran to the golf course, hopping over the waist-high chain-link fence and darting onto the fairway. There was a group of four zombies there, and Herrera led them up, knocking several over as the trio made short work of them with stabs to the head. The country club building was half a mile from their location, with the moonlight doing just enough to illuminate the rolling grassy hills of the course. The corporal led them through, darting in between smaller groups of zombies when they could, reaching a final duo of ghouls in the way. Herrera ran past them, letting the privates dispatch the undead so he could get within view of the club. He knelt by a tree on the hill, studying the area as the other two joined him. There's some movement inside, he murmured as he studied the shuffling beneath some artificial light source. Looks like they've secured the rally point, he confirmed. Let's get moving. They moved quickly across the field, making sure to wave and zigzag a bit in case someone was keeping watch. The last thing they wanted was a friendly fire incident, especially when so many of their team had already been lost. As they approached, a tall blonde soldier waved maniacally at them. We got friendlies, he called back into the room. Man, are we glad to see you, he gushed as the trio approached. Thought you were goners. Some of us were, Gilbert replied. Ayers looked them over, eyes widening. Where's Sergeant McCarty? Herrera shook his head. He didn't make it, he replied. Lost two others, too. Dixon came around from the other side of the room as Ayers' shoulders slumped. What's going on? he asked and spotted the corporal. Where's Sarge? He didn't make it, Herrera repeated. Gilbert took a deep breath. Went out like a beast, though. Holy shit, Dixon said and then turned to the corporal. So you're in charge now? Herrera nodded, letting out a deep sigh. It would appear that way. Well, I hope you're up to the task, Dixon replied, jerking his thumb over his shoulder, because we've got a shit-tastic situation on our hands. The corporal straightened his shoulders. What's going on? Well, for starters, whoever thought it was a good idea to land in the woods deserves to have their ass kicked, the private snarled because it did not go well. He pointed to the far corner of the room where two soldiers laid on couches, several other men attempting to make a leg splint. One split his leg so bad the bone was sticking out, and the other face planted into a tree so hard I'll be surprised if he remembers the last year. We should all be that lucky, Choi muttered as they came inside proper, Ayers closing the door behind them. 
On top of that, we still have seven missing, Dixon added. The trio blinked at him in shock. Christ, Choi blurted. We're already down twelve men, and we haven't even gotten started yet? Herrera furrowed his brow. Honest opinion, he began. Do you think any of them made it, and just haven't found their way here yet? Dixon immediately shook his head. That forest was the stuff of nightmares, man, he declared. If you were lucky enough to get to the ground in one piece, you had movement everywhere. That moon didn't do a damn bit of good either, lighting up just enough to scare you shitless. Frankly, I'm amazed that any of us survived it. Well, I'm glad you did, because you're going to lead the docks team, Herrera said. Both Dixon and Gilbert spat. What? At the same time. Whoa, 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 Corporal, Dixon blathered, putting up his hands. I'm not the man for that job. Corporal, I know we have our differences, Gilbert cut in. But you know I can lead that assault. Dixon motioned to the ex-sergeant. I tend to agree with him. Enough, Herrera snapped. Dixon, you're going to lead the dark mission. He put up a hand to stop Gilbert from speaking. Take Choi and go help the injured to a secure room here. We can't take them with us, and we can't leave somebody to guard them. Make sure they have provisions, because it could be days before anybody gets back to them. Gilbert wrinkled his nose, looking like he wanted to scream, but bit his tongue. Yes, sir, he mumbled, and headed off with Choi in tow. Dixon's face was pale, his terror showing in droves on his face, staring wide-eyed at the corporal. Herrera stepped forward, putting his hands on the private's shoulders to steady him. Listen to me, he said firmly. You can do this. I respectfully disagree, corporal, Dixon replied shakily. When we were back at the airport, Herrera began, Captain Kersey and I watched you interact with the men. The captain marveled at how much trust the team had in you. Dixon blinked at him. Captain Kersey said that? Yeah, and we were both impressed, because it's not an easy thing to get, the corporal added. The private took a deep breath. Corporal, I got a level with you, he said, shaking his head. I've never so much as led a Boy Scout troop, let alone a mission like this. Well, I just led my first mission less than a week ago, Herrera pointed out. And here I am being sent off in the first wave of this assault. If I can do it, you can. Just rely on your men, and they'll pull you through. Dixon nodded, his eyes slowly firming up as he bolstered his confidence. So, so what do you need me to do? he asked. Who do you trust the most in this group? Herrera asked. Private Ayers, came the immediate reply. We've been together since basic. Ayers, over here, Herrera called, waving for him to come over. The private broke away from guard duty and approached them. Yes, sir, he asked. Private Dixon here is going to be leading the dark mission, Herrera said. I need you to support him however he needs it. Ayers smirked. Look at you getting promoted, he teased. We're going to wreck some shit. He held out his fist and Dixon bumped it. Frankly, it's about time they gave you more responsibility. Herrera inclined his head. See? You got the men behind you. Okay, Dixon said firmly, finally seeming to have accepted his fate. So we gotta clear the school, then the docks, right? The corporal shook his head. The school is a lost cause, he admitted, especially with the numbers we have. You're going to have to find a new rally point a few blocks to the west of the school. And worse, you're going to have to be quiet about it. The school that bad? Ayers asked. Herrera nodded. We lost three men, including the Sarge just landing there. We'll figure something out, Dixon replied. Good, the corporal said. Now with the men we have left, who knows how to drive a big rig? Dixon pursed his lips in thought. Pretty sure Choi can handle one, he mused. Not sure who else. What about Eason? Ayers asked. Dixon turned to the other men. Hey, Eason, he called. You know how to drive a big rig? A short kid that looked no older than nineteen stood up from the splinting. In the eyes of the government? he asked. Nope. He held up a hand. In reality? Hell yeah! Herrera gaped at him. Is he even old enough to drive? He's a country boy, so he probably came out of the womb on a four-wheeler, Ayers replied offhandedly. Dixon shook his head. There's a mental image I didn't need, he muttered. I'll take him, the corporal said. Is there anybody else you can think of? Both privates shook their head. 
There were a couple more, Dixon said quietly, but they haven't shown up yet. Herrera nodded. Okay, he continued. We're going to split up into groups of nine. Pick the seven other you need and send the rest over to me. He pointed to the table in the far corner. Gotta do some planning. They'll be right over, Dixon replied and headed off. Herrera headed over to the table and pulled out a map of the island, spreading it out to study it. His original mission had been to take the docks, but now he'd have to adjust course and do the truck mission on the fly. Can I have a word? Gilbert asked from behind him. The corporal didn't even look up from his map. I know what you're going to say, and you can save it, he said flatly. I don't think you do, the private replied. You know I can lead that mission, and you're letting your personal feelings endanger the whole operation. Herrera shook his head and stood up straight. Wrong, he spat and pointed to the chair to his left. Sit. Gilbert sat, near pouting, and the corporal turned the map towards him. Three and a half miles of zombie-infested terrain to get to our target, Herrera said, pointing, and the private leaned forward to study the paper. We have half as many men as the mission parameters called for, and only four people capable of driving a truck, meaning we're going to have to make two trips on the bridges. He raised an eyebrow. What would you do? Gilbert studied the map carefully, reading a few of the handwritten notes and then following several of the lines going north with his finger. All of them went through neighborhoods and paused at a circled building halfway up with church written beside it. Well, he drawled, for starters, given the resistance we found in the neighborhood by the school, I would adjust course right out of the gate. Herrera nodded. And go where? I'd go right back through the woods where we were supposed to land, to get to this church rally point, the private said with a shrug. If we cross over some open areas, there are two more wooded areas that will take us all the way up to that church, leaving only a mile or so to the target. The corporal shook his head. You heard Dixon. The woods are a nightmare, he said. Dark and infested with zombies. You still want to go that route? Absolutely, Gilbert replied with a nod. We're going to face heavy resistance no matter how we go. At least in the woods we'd have a fighting chance to lose whatever is pursuing us. Herrera nodded as well. I came to the same conclusion, he said. What next? Gilbert continued poring over the map. Looks like there's about six blocks of dense residential housing before the shopping center, he mused. So since we're not going to have an overwhelming force to take them on, we'll have to improvise. How so? the corporal prompted. Diversion, Gilbert replied with a shrug. Car alarms, blow something up, whatever it is. It'll have to be big enough to draw enough of them away so we can slip behind the lines and move up. Herrera cocked his head. What about the two trips? There's nine of us, the private replied. So four drivers on the trucks and five riding pickup duty. The corporal raised an eyebrow. And if we lose people on the way? We pick up some ten-speed bikes and get our exercise in for the day, Gilbert replied. Herrera nodded. Now do you see why you aren't on the docks? he asked. I really don't the private replied petulantly. Because blocking off those bridges is the most important objective, the corporal said firmly. If those docks don't get cleared, the landing party can handle it, if need be, even if it takes a couple of waves. If we don't block those bridges, then they're going to get overwhelmed once the shooting starts. If something happens to me, I need someone capable who can pick up the reins and deliver. Gilbert sneered. So you're back to trusting me? Fuck no, Herrera snapped. Wouldn't trust you as far as a kindergartner could throw you. But you're experienced, and despite your major fuck-up on the bridge, you're better equipped to see this through than anybody else in the room. The private chuckled, shaking his head. I'll take it, he admitted. When do we leave? Herrera checked his watch. We're out in ten. I guess I should get prepped then, Gilbert said, and shoved back his chair, heading off to check his weapons. The corporal picked up the map and stared at the wooded area they'd be heading to. I really hope Dixon was exaggerating. Chapter 4 Herrera led the group of eight up to the edge of the woods. They stood there, listening to the light rustling and moaning coming from the trees. We sure this is the best way through? Choi asked. The corporal nodded. Surface streets are jam-packed, he replied. You're more than welcome to try, but you'll be doing it alone. 
Guess I'll take my chances with you guys, then, the private muttered. How do you want to do it? Gilbert asked. Eason took a deep breath. Guessing eight of us going together in a big pack isn't a great strategy, he said. We go in two teams of four, Herrera declared. Joy, you're with me, Gilbert. I want you to lead the other team along with Eason. If something happens to one team, at least there will be a truck driving tandem left. Gilbert nodded. Rendezvous at the church? Yep, the corporal agreed. You all have a map, so you know where we're headed if you get separated from the group. If things go really south or you can't make it to the church, fall back to Dixon's group and try again a different way. He pulled out his knife along with a retractable metal baton, jetting it out with a quick flick of his wrist. We have to move quietly through these woods. One gunshot could doom us. The men exchanged worried glances, clutching their guns with white knuckles. You heard the man. Holster those guns, Gilbert snapped, putting away his own. The soldiers complied reluctantly, switching their guns for blades and blunt objects. And one more thing, Herrera said. Based on what Dixon told me about the rough landing, it's unlikely we're going to find any survivors out here. But we could have runners, so stay frosty. The soldiers shared worried looks about the prospect of runners chasing them through the darkened woods. Let's head out, Gilbert cut in. We'll see you on the other side, Corporal. Herrera nodded and watched the ex-sergeant leading his crew down the tree line a couple hundred yards before vanishing into the forest. Let's go, the corporal said, and led his team into the trees. Choi came in behind him, Private Jacobs ducking in next, and Private Anton brought up the rear. They crept quietly and cautiously, knives and bludgeons at the ready. The only light were small rays of moonlight piercing through the limbs to illuminate small patches of ground in the darkened woods. The leaves crunching softly beneath their boots sounded much too loud. But they didn't have much of a choice in the matter. After a few hundred yards, Herrera stopped the group at the sound of significant movement up ahead. He motioned for them to stay put and slowly moved as quietly as he could to the next tree, looking out into the darkness. There was a moonlit patch between several trees with signs of tracks moving off to the side, as well as a few creatures milling about. He looked around on the ground, spotting a rock the size of his fist, and he picked it up, pitching it as hard as he could to the left of the lit area. As soon as it landed, the zombies whipped around towards the noise, moaning and shuffling off towards it. The corporal waited, holding his breath as a dozen creatures passed through the lit area. If they'd made a play for the visible creatures, they would have been overrun by the ones in the shadows. When the immediate threat passed, he motioned for the others to follow him again. They continued to move, the path relatively clear for the next ten minutes or so, the group slow and steady. They worked their way north, only occasionally having to pause for a well-timed rock throw or a quick jab to the skull of a lone zombie. Herrera brought the group to a stop again, this time at the edge of a picnic area. He peeked out at a dozen or so creatures spread out over the fifty-by-fifty-yard area, most of them hanging out by a gazebo and grill as if it were a family barbecue for the undead. As he scanned the area, he looked to the left of the woods, seeing significant movement in the shadows, like a pack just waiting to be unleashed. The corporal pursed his lips and motioned for Choi to join him. We have to cut across the open area, he breathed the words as quietly as he could. The private gaped at him, his eyes easily conveying, Are you fucking crazy? Herrera pointed to the leftmost edge, and Choi squinted his shoulders slumping when he spotted the massive amount of movement in the shadows. The private leaned in and whispered, How do you want to play it? Dead sprint, don't worry about noise, the corporal replied softly. Just get across and get back to cover, and we'll lose them in the woods. Choi nodded and then stepped back to relay the message to the others. They clustered around behind their superior, ready to roll. Herrera readied himself, giving another scan of the field. They were about fifteen yards away from the left edge where all the movement was, and twenty yards from the congregating barbecue zombies. He gripped his weapons tightly and then took off like a shot. He broke from the tree line like a sprinter out of the blocks, his trio of men following several yards behind in a staggered pattern. There weren't as many leaves on the ground, but the heavy pounding of boots on the grass was enough to alert the zombies in the area. He glanced to the right, where a few barbecue ghouls staggered towards him. To the left, dozens of creatures emerged from the trees, moaning and arms outstretched. 
He wasn't worried, as there was more than enough space between them. However, as they got halfway across the field, the collective noise of their bootfalls had alerted more corpses in front of them. He continued running even at the sight of half a dozen zombies shambling out of the woods ahead. They were spread out well, so it wasn't overwhelming. When he came within ten yards, three ghouls appeared right in his trajectory. Just before he reached them to attack, the sound of rapid footsteps made his heart rate triple. A runner burst out of the trees, shoving past a slower zombie and tore towards the corporal. Herrera didn't have time to attack, instinctively shoving the fast-moving ghoul to the left as it got close to him. He kept his momentum and slammed his knife into the zombie he'd originally been aiming for, and then whirled around at the sound of Anton's screams. The runner latched onto the poor private's shoulder, and Herrera stared at the horrific mauling, eyes wide. Watch it! Choi barked and darted forward to tackle a creature within an arm's length of the corporal's back. He hopped on top of the fallen ghoul and stabbed down repeatedly into its face, sending blood everywhere. Herrera snapped back to reality and lunged for another nearby creature, bashing in its head with his baton. Both men returned their attention to Anton as Jacobs managed to slam his knife into the runner's head as it tore another strip off of his friend. Jacobs, we gotta move, Herrera cried seeing the horde of creatures gaining ground past the blooded duo. The private looked down at his friend, bleeding profusely from his shoulder wound. He reached down to help him up, and Anton immediately snapped off his vest, shoving it against Jacob's chest. "'Take my ammo and go!' he demanded. Jacob stared at his comrade and then gulped, nodding and running off to join the others. Anton picked his weapons off of the ground, let out a primal scream, and ran headlong into the crowd of zombies, flailing wildly, and trying his best to take out as many as possible, while making as much noise as he could. Herrera led his two remaining team members into the woods, running as hard as he could through the trees, barely able to see what was ahead. He could hear the other two several yards behind him, but he tried to focus on clearing them a safe path. As he approached a tree, a figure emerged from behind it. He grabbed it by the shirt, forcing it back up against the trunk, and delivered a few brutal strikes to the head dropping it to the ground. His chest heaved for a few beats, rage thrumming through him as he berated himself for shoving the runner aside and costing Anton his life. Come on, Corporal, Choi huffed as they caught up. We gotta keep moving. Jacobs nodded. He's right, we gotta move. Herrera nodded, taking another few deep breaths to steady himself. Choi, take point, he instructed and the private gave a thumbs up before darting off into the woods. Jacobs patted the corporal on the shoulder, giving him an encouraging glance, and Herrera gave him a nod before they followed their teammate. Chapter 5 Dixon led his group up the road a few blocks to the west of the school. They'd taken the long way around, venturing south several blocks before crossing over, taking the corporal's warning seriously. The group of nine moved up the lightly packed street with several soldiers rushing forward to dispatch zombies with their blades. With the route clear, Dixon led them to a house on the corner. The road was filled with ten houses on either side of the street, a quaint little slice of American life. The road ran straight into a row of trees into a dead end. Ayers, Hurst, clear the house, Dixon whispered. Both privates complied, heading up to the house as the others fanned out to secure a perimeter around the building. Try the knob, Ayers suggested, and Hurst turned it, finding it unlocked. He nodded to his partner receiving one in return, and then shoved the door open. Ayers burst inside, his companion quickly following, and moved into the living room, where visibility was next to nothing. He tripped over a corpse on the floor and then immediately leapt back, slamming into the wall. Hurst barked a laugh, earning a glare from his friend. The fuck is so funny? Ayers snapped. Hurst pulled out a flashlight and clicked it on, showing that the corpse on the floor was missing the top part of its head, a shotgun lying on the ground beside it. Ayers shook his head and finally conceded with a laugh, relieved that they weren't in any immediate danger. If you're finished shitting yourself, can we clear the rest of the house? Hurst asked. Ayers nodded, and the two men glanced in the kitchen, seeing nothing, and then moved down the hallway. As they approached the back bedroom, there was clear moaning and smacking against the door. The force of the banging intensified as they moved cautiously, moved down the narrow hallway, readying their knives as they grew closer. 
I go low, you go high, Hurst asked. Ayers shrugged. Works for me, he replied. If you want to be a dead dick level, I'm not going to fight you on it. Well, I know how much you like to watch, his friend quipped, chuckling. Ayers rolled his eyes. Just make sure you hold the fucker steady. Just make sure you don't miss, Hurst shot back. They reached the door, setting their flashlights on the ground, pointing up to illuminate the hall. Hurst took a knee, readying himself, and Ayers grabbed the knob. He turned it, and as soon as he did, Hurst gave it a great heave. It was heavy, but he was able to open it enough that a zombie wriggled through it. He immediately shoved his hands up into the creature's chest, holding it at bay. Ayers stabbed downward, jamming his blade into the top of its skull. Before the creature dropped, however, a chorus of moans erupted from the room. He's not alone, Ayers cried, and Hurst reinforced his grip, grabbing the creature's shirt tightly and holding it in place as a barricade against the several other zombies trying to pour through the door. Ayers reached down and grabbed his flashlight, shining it into a duo of creatures pressing against their unmoving brother. When I tell you, lean it to the left, Ayers instructed. Okay, now, he cried, and Hurst moved to the corpse, creating an opening for his companion to strike. Ayers stabbed one of the zombies in the eye and then leapt back before one of the rotted arms could catch him. One more, we got this, he huffed. Hurst struggled to hold the ghoul up while his partner found the next target. A second later, a teenage zombie reached past the slumped ghoul, managed to grip his arm. Get this fucker off of me, Hurst bellowed, and Ayers lined up his shot, stabbing right through the top of the dead teenager's head. Hurst shook off the death grip and both soldiers waited for a moment, listening to the moaning coming from the room, but not seeing the creature. Ayers shone the light over the corpse's head into the room, and couldn't see anything. I hear something, but don't see it, he hissed. We're gonna have to go in. Gonna need a second to get up, Hurst groaned. You ready? His partner nodded. Go for it. Hurst shoved the zombie barricade back into the room and scrambled to his feet, while Ayers kept watch. The two men slowly entered the room, shining their flashlights all around. The sound of clattering chains echoed and they both froze at the sight before them. Oh, that's just fucked up, Ayers breathed. On the bed was an older woman, easily in her late seventies, chained by the arms and legs to a bed, thrashing about. Her mouth was bloody, but it was dried and looked like it had been that way for a while. Hurst shone the light onto the zombies they'd taken out, seeing several bite marks on them. Looks like they were caring for Granny here when she turned, Hurst said, grimacing. Set off a nasty chain reaction. Ayers shook his head. Might explain why my living room assaulter blew his own top, he said. Can't imagine having to lock my family away and listen to them trying to eat me alive. Almost makes me glad I never had much of a family life, Hurst added. His partner sighed. Thank God for small miracles, right? Hurst chuckled darkly. Come on, let's finish her off and go tell Dixon. Ayers took out Granny with a well-placed strike to the head, and then they headed back out of the quiet house to find Dixon. They found him using a flashlight to study his map out front, standing with Private Shaw. Best I can tell, we're about three blocks to the west of the high school, Dixon was saying. Shaw nodded as he stared at the map and then glanced down the street to the west, a block where there was a thick line of trees. It's gotta be, he agreed, because that tree line looks like this one on the map. So if we cut through there, we should be at the docks in another three blocks. Then this is where we're setting up camp, Dixon replied, lowering the paper. Ayers clucked his tongue as they approached. Man, you picked a hell of a house there, buddy, he declared. Find some new friends? Dixon asked. Ayers shook his head and ran a hand through his cropped hair. Fuck, he breathed. Rabid granny murdering the family situation in there, Hurst explained. Dixon wrinkled his nose. Not high up on my list of ways to go, he said. You get it cleared, though? Yeah, it's cleared, Ayers replied with a nod. Although we might want to put a sign on that back bedroom. Nobody else really needs to see that. Dixon nodded. Good work, guys, he commended but we still got a lot to do. You got a plan? Ayers asked. Dixon motioned to the neighborhood and then pointed to the map. Yep, and hope we find some ibuprofen in one of these houses, he said, because we're gonna need it. 
Well, doesn't that sound promising? Hurst said dryly. You know you wouldn't want it any other way, Dixon quipped with a small smile. I mean, if you didn't get to bitch about a mission, did that mission actually happen? The quartet shared a laugh, even Hurst shaking his head. Okay, so this is what we're doing, Dixon began, holding up the map. This road dead ends at that tree line, which is about to be our backstop. We need to get the cars from the driveways and start blocking off this road. Start from one row from house to house and reinforce if you can. Hurst raised a hand. What if we can't find the keys? Remember the ibuprofen? Dixon asked, raising an eyebrow. Break the window, pop it in neutral, and start pushing. That's gonna be fun on grass, Hurst muttered. Once that's done, we need to do a sweep of the houses, Dixon continued, making sure if a yard doesn't have a fence that we plug up the hole somehow. I don't care if it's another car or we start having outdoor couches like we're rednecks in rural Alabama. Anything and everything to slow these things down once we start making noise. Shaw, get the others and start making this happen. Shaw nodded. I'm on it. Ayers, Hurst, got another job for you, Dixon said as Shaw ran off. Hurst laced his fingers behind his head. Let me guess, he drawled. More zombie killing? No, just containment, Dixon replied, shaking his head. We have an indoor area we can retreat to if things get bad. Now I just need you to make sure the rest of the houses are secure. We'll let those on the boats deal with them once they get here. Ayers grinned. I like the way you think, he said. Glad to hear it, Dixon replied and waved them off. Now get moving. Lots to get done. Chapter 6 Herrera, Jacobs, and Choi emerged from the woods a few blocks south of the church rally point. Their chests heaved from the running and fighting through the multiple wooded areas, still reeling from the loss of Anton. Church should be a few blocks to the north, the corporal huffed. As they stepped out onto the street, they looked to the west and spotted a small band of zombies, at least a few dozen, about fifty yards away. They weren't paying attention to the soldiers, so Herrera casually headed across the street into a neighborhood. The group took a knee by the house, realizing they'd nearly doomed themselves by not paying attention. The corporal was silent, motioning for the other two to follow him. He crept around the house, knife at the ready, reaching the backyard. It was fenced in, as were the neighboring houses. There was movement from a few other yards, but none in their direct path. They hopped the fences and quickly moved through the neighborhood, seeing several clusters of zombies all around. When they reached the house across the street from the church, there was a handful of ghouls hanging out in the front lawn. Either of you know how to pick locks? Herrera whispered. Jacobs raised his hand. I'm not the best at it, he admitted quietly, but I can get it done. You go straight for the door, the corporal instructed. Choi and I will handle the zombies. Jacobs nodded and pulled out his lock-picking tools while the other two readied their blades. I'll take the three on the left, Herrera murmured. You get the two on the right. Choi cocked his head. I can take the three if you want, he whispered. Nah, the corporal replied, shaking his head. I need to get out some frustration. The private nodded and waited for his superior to move. Herrera broke from cover, running as hard as he could towards the trio of zombies on the left side of the yard. He jammed his blade into one creature's face at full speed, the hilt smacking against the forehead of the ghoul. He shoved the beast away, preparing to strike at the next two that approached him, shoulder to shoulder. He darted to the side, grabbing one zombie by the shirt and shoving it into the other. He pumped his legs, driving the clumsy monsters back against the wall of the church. He stabbed one in the eye socket, and then ripped his blade free and gave the one in the back the same treatment stepping back to watch them slide to the ground. He turned to check on Jacobs, who was working diligently on the door as Choi finished off his second zombie. Past him, a dozen creatures shambled around the side of the church building. Fuck, he growled, and took off like a shot. Choi, he yelled. The private looked up, meeting Herrera's wild eyes as he ran, and then turned around to see the threat growing by the second. The corporal joined him when the zombies were about fifteen yards away. Jacobs, you almost there? Herrera barked. Need another minute, came the strained reply. The duo stared at the ambling horde, shaking their heads. Not sure we can pull this off with knives, Choi said. Herrera sucked his bottom lip between his teeth. We're gonna have to, he replied. If we start shooting, those things are going to be on us before Gilbert gets here. Fucking hell, 
Choi growled in frustration. They readied their weapons, falling into loose fighting stances. Charge them, push them back, the corporal instructed, and then start stabbing the ones still standing. Go! They both rushed forward, a few yards apart from each other. They hit the lead zombies on either side of the horde at the same time, shoving them back into the others. Seven zombies toppled to the ground like bowling pins, and then the soldiers immediately began stabbing creatures at the edges of the mass, trying to bottle up the rest so they had a fighting chance. They dropped a few zombies each before looking back at the ones that were making it back up to their feet. Past that, a fresh dozen appeared around the corner, attracted by the noise. This ain't working, Choi warned. Herrera shook his head. We gotta wait on Gilbert, he cried. The private let out a frustrated scream and prepared another attack. Just before he leapt forward, several shots exploded in the distance, ripping through the zombies in front of them. They turned to see Gilbert, Eason, and one other soldier approaching, guns blazing. Go hot, Herrera cried, and he and Choi pulled their assault rifles, opening fire on the horde. In a matter of seconds, their friends joined them, and the monsters all fell. About time you made it, Herrera said, clapping Gilbert on the shoulder as the last zombie crumpled to the ground. The private took a deep breath. Dixon wasn't lying about those woods, he said. Yeah, no shit, Choi agreed. Herrera's brow furrowed. Down one? Gilbert nodded, his face pale. Pack of runners. We had one too, Choi replied. Come on, the corporal cut in. We gotta get inside before the reinforcements get here. The soldiers turned towards the door just as there was a satisfying click. Got the door, Jacobs announced proudly and pushed on it. Several rotted hands emerged, grabbing onto his shirt. He screamed and struggled as they pulled him inside, arms flailing. Jacobs! Herrera screamed, and the five soldiers rushed to his aid, opening fire at the door, shooting wildly through it and hoping they scored a hit. The corporal lowered his shoulder and smashed through it, the impact driving several zombies back onto the ground. He fired three precise shots, hitting the downed creatures in the head. Gilbert entered next, taking out one remaining creature to the left. Gilbert! Joy! Clear the building! Herrera barked, and the soldiers in question pulled out their flashlights and took off into the main area. Eason and Private Greer joined Herrera, who was standing over poor Jacobs, struggling to breathe through the bite wounds on his neck. He held the wounds uselessly, blood pouring out of him in droves. Help me pull him clear, Herrera said, and the two men dragged Jacobs clear of the door, securing it behind them. Go make sure the rest of the building is secure, the corporal demanded. Sir, I... Eason said hoarsely. Go, Herrera snapped. Now! The soldiers hesitated, but finally nodded and ran off, pulling out their flashlights. Herrera took a knee and swallowed hard, pulling out his handgun. I'm sorry, Private, he murmured. I really am. He stared down into the young man's fear-filled eyes and immediately fired a round through his forehead in an attempt not to drag out the kid's suffering. The blast echoed throughout the cavernous structure and he stared down at the dead soldier for a beat before taking a deep breath and refocusing on their task. He walked into the main chapel of the church a modest-sized area, big enough to house a few hundred people on a Sunday. As he entered, the four other soldiers stood by the pulpit, solemn after what they knew their corporal had had to do. Report, Herrera said. Gilbert stepped forward. Building is clear, he said. We're alone in here. We're secure too, Eason added. Nothing's getting in. Herrera took a deep breath. Good. He pulled out his map and spread it on the pulpit motioning for the soldiers to gather around. He pointed to a school two blocks to the east. This is our target, a school building. According to the intel, they have a propane cooking system for the cafeteria. We have to get there, rig it to blow, and then get back here before it does. Once it goes off, it should be loud enough to draw everything in the immediate vicinity to it. Thereby clearing the path to the shopping center, Gilbert added. Herrera nodded and pointed to the shopping center to the northwest. We're about six blocks away from it as the crow flies, he said. Hopefully this diversion is enough to make it possible for us to get through. How are we taking it out? Greer asked nervously. I don't know about anybody else, but I didn't bring anything that can be remotely detonated. Herrera pointed to the back of the church altar, which housed several candles. Smart, Greer replied, as the soldiers nodded, getting the gist of the plan. We get to the school, 
the corporal explained. Take out the pilot lights, light these puppies up, and haul ass back here. Eason nodded thoughtfully. School goes up, he said, and they walk right past us. In theory, at any rate, Gilbert countered. Choi raised an eyebrow. You got a better idea? Gilbert shook his head. Nope, he replied dryly. In fact, this was my idea. That's true, Herrera agreed. But if anybody has a better one, I'm all ears. The three other soldiers glanced at each other and then shook their heads. Good, the corporal replied, and clapped his hands together. Everybody get candles and a way to light them. We leave in five. Chapter 7 Dixon watched from the front porch of the safe house as eight men scrambled to secure the makeshift rally point. Several soldiers pushed a car to the top of the road to fill the last gap in the metal wall spanning the space between two houses. Another soldier stood guard on the opposite side of the wall watching for trouble. A few moments went by and he let out a whistle. Two men immediately broke off from pushing the car and ran over to him. They walked across the street to another house where a trio of zombies shambled out from the side yard. With three quick strikes, the threat was eliminated, and they went back to their jobs. Dixon nodded in approval as Ayers and Hurst approached him. We may have an issue, Ayers said. Dixon sighed. Just the words every leader wants to hear, he replied. What's up? The side yards are secure, but the other side of the trees are going to be an issue, Hurst replied. You may just want to come see for yourself, Ayers added. Dixon nodded. All right. Lead on, he said, and then whistled at the guys pushing the car. They glanced up and he motioned that he was heading down the street, prompting them to give him a thumbs up that they understood. As the trio walked, Dixon appraised the barricades between the houses. The men had used couches, playhouses, and all things in between. Good thing we picked a ritzy neighborhood to squat in, he said. Lots of good stuff to pick from. Ayers barked a laugh. Ritzy doesn't even begin to describe it he said. Check out this house on the corner. As they walked by the final house, Dixon picked up a flyer from the for sale sign on the front yard. He recoiled at the price. Holy shit, he said. You could buy my hometown for this. Hurst shook his head. You could probably buy most of it with just the property taxes. That's some serious first world problems right there, Dixon added, and the three men chuckled as they wandered over to the tree line. It stretched about twenty-five yards before it reached the next neighborhood, which led directly to the docks. They walked into it and came across a fence halfway through. It was a chain link and about waist high. Dixon wiggled it a little. This seems pretty sturdy. That's not the issue, Ayers said and hopped over it. The trio approached the edge of the woods and took a knee at the edge of the woods. What am I looking at? Dixon asked quietly. Ayers pointed down the street a block or so, and he squinted at it. When it came into focus, Dixon's stomach dropped. There were about a hundred zombies in the middle of the road, stretching to a house on the corner. Fuck me, Dixon breathed. Looks like something drew their attention, and it never got broken, Ayers said quietly. Dixon shook his head. What about to the north and south of us? he asked. We went a block in each direction, and it's just stragglers with some small batches, Hurst replied. Nothing bigger than ten. Dixon stared at the threat, wondering how in the hell they'd pull this off without drawing much attention to themselves. Shooting is out, that's for sure, he muttered. Why? Hurst asked. We have more than enough ammo to take them down. Dixon shook his head. Because we run the risk of pulling the school to us, he explained and we certainly don't have enough ammo for that, let alone both. Hand to hand? Ayers asked. Hurst snorted. Please, be my guest, he said. I'm not holding them up this time. I mean, we can draw them back to the fence line here, Ayers continued. We check a few houses, upgrade our weapons. Somebody has to have a baseball bat or something. Hurst scratched the back of his head. Great, he replied. But how do we get them up here? Dixon glanced over at the yard closest to them, seeing a standalone shed. Let's check in there, he said. The trio darted out from cover, moving quickly and quietly towards the small structure. When they reached it, they found it locked with a cheap padlock. Hurst stepped forward and smashed it with the butt of his rifle. A few strikes later, and then the entire lock broke off. 
They opened it up, staring around at the typical shed material. A few bikes, a lawnmower, tools. Now we're cooking, Dixon said, picking up a three-gallon can of kerosene. He shook it, noting it was about two-thirds of the way full. He looked around for a dish, finding a small dog bowl filled with nails and screws. He grabbed it and dumped it on the floor. Okay, you boys get back to the fence line, he instructed. One of you grab a few of the others and some more weapons, and I'll bring the zombies to you. The soldiers shared a concerned glance. Dixon rolled his eyes. Don't worry, I'm a trained professional, he assured them. I was doing jackass-style stunts way before they even had a TV show. Now get moving. They'll be at the fence before you know it. The two men rushed off, and Dixon took the goods and walked down the street towards the horde. There were over a hundred in the road, all focused on one house, paying him no attention at all. He stopped about twenty yards away, staying as quiet as he could. He gently set down the dog dish and poured in some kerosene, filling it up. He looked up and saw a few of the ghouls had acknowledged him, turning to shamble in his direction. Oh good, I get a crowd for my performance, he drawled, and then lit up the liquid in the dish. It burned brightly, and he took a step back, picking up the can. He aimed the nozzle down and began to pour. As soon as the stream hit the fire, flames leapt up into it, and Dixon flung his arms side to side, sending plumes of flaming liquid into the horde. After a few good sprays, he reared back and lobbed the canister as hard as he could. Flaming liquid spun wildly as the can floated through the air, coating every zombie it came into contact with. Soon the darkness of the night was illuminated with flaming corpses. Damn, Dixon breathed, swiping his palms together. That worked better than I thought. He backed up slowly, watching as the bulk of the horde began to come after him. Some of the ghouls started to collapse from flame damage, and before long the fire started to tamp down, but the zombies were sufficiently drawn towards him. Hope they're ready, he muttered, and turned, jogging back to the tree line, pushing through to the fence. When he reached it, Ayers, Hurst, and two others stood there armed with bats, hammers, and a sharpened pool cue. Dixon hopped the fence to join them. I saw the tail end of that, Ayers declared. I had no idea you were such a wild man. Dixon smirked. You should see me when I know I have an audience, he declared. The men shared a chuckle, and then he continued. If you men got this, I'm going to go check on the others and make sure we're good to go up there, because once this is clear we have to do the same thing all the way to the docks. We got you, man, Hurst assured him. Go do what you gotta do. Dixon nodded and headed away from the line as the first few zombies approached. He listened to the sound of cracking skulls, smiling to himself in the knowledge that they were one step closer to success. Chapter 8 Herrera led his team through the neighborhood towards the school. They took out a couple of zombies hanging out in the side yard of a house, efficiently and quietly, as if they were more of a nuisance than a threat. The group took a knee and looked out at the school, a mid-sized building smaller than the average supercenter. A decently sized pack of ghouls milled about out front, several dozen, it looked like. Towards the back, where the sports fields sprawled, there were almost a hundred monsters spread across. Near the back of the school was a smaller pack, no more than a dozen. The corporal pointed to the rear. We get in through the back windows, then find our way to the cafeteria. What about the door on the side of the building? Greer asked, pointing to a lone door along a brick wall in the centre, looking flush with no handle. That looks like a fire door, Gilbert said quietly. Herrera nodded. That's our exit point, then, he confirmed. Once we set this thing to blow, we're going to have to move quickly. Weapons? Choi asked. The corporal held up his knife. Melee only until we set the fire. Then all bets are off, he replied. Questions? The soldiers shook their heads. Let's move out, Herrera said, and then led the group away from the house, sprinting across the street to the school. Their footsteps were loud, attracting a little attention from the field zombies, who turned and began to shamble in their direction. The soldiers ignored them, rushing straight towards the closest window they could find. As they reached the building, Herrera and Gilbert ran forward, jamming their blades into the two closest zombies. Meanwhile, Choi used the butt of his rifle to smash a window. We're in, he hissed, and then knelt down, creating a step stool out of his thigh. 
Greer boosted up first, diving inside and immediately hopping up to clear the small classroom. The door was shut and he checked it to make sure it was secure, and then he turned to help the others inside. Herrera entered last, glancing over his shoulder to see that the field zombies were still a good distance away. He hauled himself up onto the window ledge and Eason pulled him in. Everybody good? the corporal asked. There was a collective murmur in the affirmative, and he nodded, heading for the classroom door. He peeked out through the tiny window, seeing nothing but darkness, and pulled out his flashlight. Gonna have to risk it, he muttered, and then shone the light through the window. There was nothing in the hallway close to the door that he could see, so he cracked it open and shone the flashlight down the hall, lighting up half a dozen zombies that immediately turned towards the disturbance. Six down the hall, Herrera said. Let's clear them out. The soldiers walked out of the classroom, drawing their own flashlights as well. They stalked up the hallway, ready to throw down with the rival zombie gang. As they approached, Choi and Gilbert grabbed the first two ghouls and flung them up against lockers on opposite sides of the hall to take them out, clearing the path for the others to move up. The rest stepped through the gap and quickly stabbed the remaining creatures, clearing the hallway. When they reached the crossroads, the corporal shone his flashlight in each direction. The main hallway had a few stragglers towards the end, while the other two directions were clear. He illuminated the wall, seeing a small sign reading lunch room with an arrow pointing down one of the unoccupied hallways. Gilbert, Choi, stay here and make sure our escape route is clear, Herrera said. Greer, Eason, you're with me. He waved to them, and they joined him as Gilbert and Choi kept their flashlights trained on the creatures at the far end of the hall. Thankfully, the zombies seemed uninterested in the light. The corporal led the other two down towards the lunchroom. He paused before entering peering through the window, shining his light to see. There were a few zombies in the eating area, some of them tangled up in the chairs, thrashing about in a feeble attempt to free themselves. You two, clear the room, Herrera instructed. I'll handle the kitchen. They nodded as he breached the door. Greer and Eason immediately headed for the zombies, and the corporal hopped up onto one of the long tables and ran down it, avoiding the tangled mass of chairs on the ground. As he hopped down, he bolted through the double doors into the kitchen, quickly sweeping it for threats and seeing none. Herrera removed the candles from his bag, setting them on the front counter and lighting them up. Once they were blazing, he rushed over to the stoves, flipping on every single gas burner, but not using the igniter. The hiss of propane filled the air and he quickly caught a whiff of it. This isn't going to take long, he muttered, and tore out of the kitchen. Fuse is lit! We gotta move! he yelled and the two soldiers broke away from their battle to run to the door. As the trio burst out of the lunchroom, Herrera hollered, We're lit! Weapons hot! Gilbert and Choi immediately drew their assault rifles and fired a few rounds downrange, striking a few zombies that ambled up the hallway towards them. As soon as the other three joined them, the team sprinted towards the fire exit door at the end of the hall. Herrera reached it first, slamming into it, but finding resistance. A few rotted hands pushed their way in, grasping at him. Get down, Gilbert cried. The corporal dropped to one knee as Gilbert shoved his assault rifle into the door above his head. He fired off a few three-round bursts, shredding the faces of a few ghouls and easing the pressure on the door. Herrera pushed hard and Choi joined him, the two of them staying low so that Gilbert had a firing window. As the door opened far enough, the trigger-happy private pushed his way through, turning quickly and firing behind the door. We gotta move, he barked. The rest of the men rushed out from the school and the door slammed shut behind them. The field zombies had reached the building and were closing in. Eason and Choi began to fire, clearing out the ones that were closest. Herrera glanced at Gilbert, who was shooting into dozens of creatures from the front yard horde, closing in. Back to the church, the corporal yelled, and the group fired a few more rounds before sprinting away from the school. When they hit the neighborhood across from it, Several zombies emerged from around houses to investigate what the noise was. The group ignored them and kept running, even though their bootfalls were gaining attention. When they approached the church, there were a dozen or so zombies standing between them and the building. Herrera stopped short about ten yards away and readied his weapon. The other soldiers joined him to create a devastating firing line. As quickly as they began shooting, the zombies dropped, and the battle was over, with well-placed shots to the head. 
Herrera opened the front door they'd left unlocked and ushered the soldiers inside before entering last and slamming it. He peered out the window, seeing zombies coming towards them in every direction. Sure hope this works, he uttered, and locked the door before retreating to the chapel. The soldiers collapsed in the pews, chests heaving, and Herrera joined them, setting down his rifle and cracking his neck. That was fun, Greer said brightly, having PTSD flashbacks to my worst P.E. class. Gilbert shook his head. Only thing missing were the cheerleaders laughing at you, he quipped. That never happened to me, Greer replied, puffing out his chest a bit. Look at me, Gilbert replied, patting his belly. Might have happened a few times in my day. A chuckle rippled through the men in a much-needed moment of levity. Finally, Choi asked, So, how long until that thing blows? No idea, Herrera replied, shaking his head. I put the candles on the far side of the room, so it might take a while for the room to fill up with gas. Wait, how big was the room? Eason asked, straightening up. The corporal shrugged. I don't know, he replied. About the size of this one, only with lower ceilings? Eason looked around, the wheels turning in his head. Yeah, he said, swallowing hard. We may want to get away from the windows. The soldiers shared concerned glances and then slowly moved to the center of the room. It can't be that bad, can it? Troy asked as he took a seat on the floor. Eason scratched the back of his head. Look at the bright side, he drawled. We're going to get attention. The group hunkered down, and then, as if on cue, a loud boom rattled the building. The windows tittered, a few of them cracking, and the soldiers held their breath, hoping that they wouldn't shatter. Luckily, the windows held, and they let out deep sighs collectively. Damn, they probably heard that at the docks, Greer said. Herrera shook his head. Let's hope not, he said. We're going to have enough to deal with without more coming up. He headed for the window, staying out of sight as he peeked out. The zombies that had been in pursuit of them had turned around and headed towards the school, a bright light in the distance. The corporal nodded and smiled approvingly. Gilbert, set a timer, he declared. For the next thirty minutes, we're on break. The private let out a deep sigh of relief and hit his watch before laying across a pew on his back. The troops spread out, stretching their tired limbs, and Herrera stayed at the window, keeping watch on the outside. He watched the flood of zombies moving towards the explosion. Come on, you know you bastards want to go to the bonfire. Chapter 9 Dixon led Ayers and Hurst toward the docks, stepping over charred remains of kerosene-doused zombies as they went. Three others were in this portion of the neighborhood, using cars to block off side streets, while three remained back at the first blocked-off zone to make sure nothing would sneak up on them. As they moved, there was an explosion in the distance. The force of the blast wasn't much, but it was bright enough to light up a small bit of sky in the distance. God damn, Herrera, Dixon said, eyes wide with awe. Guess you aren't much for subtlety. Hurst shook his head. Please don't get any ideas he begged, looking down at the charred corpses. You've already done a good job of burning shit down. Don't worry, Dixon assured him. I got out with my eyebrows still intact, so I'm calling it a win. Plus, if Herrera asks, we can always say we didn't see anything. If it keeps you restrained, then I'm all for it, Ayers quipped. The three soldiers kept their rifles ready as they headed down towards the docks. They were two blocks away from the water and could already hear the lapping of waves jostling around from the wind. At the next intersection, they stopped in the middle, looking both ways. There was a small pack of zombies down a block to the south and a lone zombie to the north. Don't see much of a threat here, Dixon said quietly. Let's keep moving. The others can handle it if these guys get frisky. He led them towards the docks, stopping at the end of the road. The only thing separating them from the water was another row of houses. I can only imagine what these cost, Ayers muttered. Hurst smirked. Maybe if we all pull our money together, we can rent it out for a weekend. Nah, I'd rather just take it by force, Dixon replied, and readied his rifle. He led them across the street, stopping at the front door of the nearest house and peeking in the movement. There was a little movement inside, towards the back. Two at the back, he said quietly. Ayers, you're with me. Hurst, you clear the first floor. They nodded, and he turned the knob, pushing it in quickly. 
He crept inside with Aya's right on his heels, aiming in tandem and each taking out their targets with a single shot. Hurst swept the first floor, stopping at the stairs. Clear, he declared. Hit the second floor, Dixon instructed. We've got the back. Hurst headed up as the other two walked to the back door. They opened it up, revealing a large patio. Dixon stepped out, looking straight out at the water. He couldn't help but admire the moonlit sand, and then Ayers grabbed him by the collar and yanked him back inside, quietly shutting the door behind them. What the hell? Dixon hissed. Ayers shushed him, and then motioned to the window. Dixon looked out and then spotted several zombies to either side of the deck, stretching down several houses. He cursed himself for being so distracted by the water. Well, that's not going to work now, is it? he muttered. Another lone shot went off upstairs, startling the duo. They looked out at the zombies that were moaning and looking around for the source of the noise. A few moments later, Hurst entered the room. Not much upstairs, just shh. Ayers hushed him, and Hurst blinked in confusion. His companions motioned to the window, and he peered out, wrinkling his nose. Dixon waved for them to follow, and the trio retreated to the living room. How do you want to handle this? Hurst asked quietly. Dixon pursed his lips as he reloaded his rifle. Pop in a full mag, he said. We pick off a few from the deck and bring them over to us. If there aren't too many, we bottleneck them up on the stairs and grab a meat tenderizer from the kitchen and do some work. And if there are too many of them? Ayers asked, raising an eyebrow. Dixon shrugged, holding up his rifle. That's why we have the full mags. He led the group into the kitchen, stopping by the drawers and rummaging around until he found a large meat tenderizing hammer. How did you know they'd have one? Hurst wondered. Dixon smirked. Place like this with a view like that? He drawled. And you know they're grilling a lot. Remind me to check the liquor cabinet before we head back, Hurst replied. Can't grill without a drink in the hand. Dixon chuckled. Just make sure you stash it well, he warned. Don't want to be sharing any with those boat boys who have been lounging around at sea for the last month. What side did you want? Ayers asked. Hurst inclined his head. I got right, you got left. Ayers nodded and slid the door open. The three men stepped outside, getting into position, with Dixon waiting at the stairs in the centre. The duo took aim and fired within a second of each other, quickly popping off several rounds, dropping ghouls on either side of the house. Moans rippled through the air as creatures on both sides emerged from the shadows. What had initially looked like a dozen swelled into three dozen, all of them hungry and coming their way. That hammer isn't going to do much good, Ayers warned, and Dixon nodded, dropping it and stepping back. The duo on the left did a good job of clearing out a dozen or so zombies in a short period of time, bullets ripping through skulls. When they were down to about eight, Hurst bellowed, Need a hand over here! He panic-fired, sending three round bursts into a crowd of zombies. Dixon dashed over, seeing several zombies had made it to the front of the deck. He hopped up on the banister, aiming straight down and opening fire in three round bursts. The bullets ripped through the tops of the heads as well as the shoulders, depleting his mag. He reloaded as he surveyed the carnage, seeing most of the ones in the front had dropped. Ayers approached as Dixon hopped back down from the railing. My side is clear, he said, and then glanced over the side. Damn, man, you fucked him up. Never underestimate what a bit of panic fire can do. Dixon replied as Hurst resumed single shots into the smaller horde. Clear, he reported, lowering his gun. The soldiers congregated on the right side of the deck, surveying the three dozen bodies sprawled in the grass. Dixon patted Hurst's shoulder a few times. Come on, he said. We gotta find something to let the boys know where to land. The trio headed inside and began rifling through closets, Hurst taking the garage. He entered the main house again holding a stack of tiki torches. Hey, think this will work? he asked. Dixon inspected them, finding the fuel reserves full. Lighting the way, he said, and took a long sniff of the Cintronella. And keeping the mosquitoes away. Bonus. Let's get them set up and we'll leave them a note on the sliding glass door letting them know where we are. Chapter 10 Herrera and his team hid inside a large gas station across the street from the large shopping centre. There were four large anchor stores, along with several hundred yards worth of smaller stores. There were easily a few hundred zombies that they could see from their vantage point, milling about in the parking lot area. The solar-powered streetlights were still bright, 
just as if it were any other night, except the glow illuminated rotted heads as opposed to Christmas shoppers. The soldiers shared a lukewarm bottle of water and some salty snacks. Doesn't look like that school did nearly enough for us, Greer said dryly. Choi swallowed a mouthful of chips and shrugged. It got us this far, didn't it? Hundreds passed by the church, and that was just from what I could see, Herrera pointed out. Gilbert nodded. I would much rather face a few hundred than a few thousand. Yeah, that's true, Greer agreed and then sighed. Still, would have been nice if it was totally clear. Eason took a deep breath. So, how are we doing this? We're not going to bother going through the stores, Herrera replied. We're just going to head around back and go straight for the trucks. Greer shook his head. Man, that's one hell of a run on foot, he said dryly. Especially if the back of the stores looks like the front. Really easy to get bottlenecked in there. I'm open to suggestions, the corporal admitted. What about that pickup truck just across from us? Gilbert asked, motioning to a shiny truck on the edge of the parking lot. I mean, we're going to need transport from the Western Bridge anyway. Might as well kill two birds. Eason nodded thoughtfully. If we're going to do that, wouldn't it be smarter to backtrack to the nearly empty neighborhoods, though? He asked. Don't know about you, but all I saw were luxury sedans in the driveways, Gilbert pointed out. If we have to plow through these fuckers, we're going to need something with a little more oomph. Choi sighed. Downside to being on a rich person's island, he said. Heavy-duty trucks aren't really popular. Corporal, what do you think? Greer asked. Herrera cocked his head. Who knows how to hotwire a car? Choi looked back and forth and then hesitantly raised his hand. The corporal raised an eyebrow. That didn't look very confident, he said. Because it isn't, Choi admitted, lowering his hand. It's been years since I've done it. Gilbert leaned forward. Question is, can you do it now? I think I can, Choi replied, though his voice didn't sound sure. We'll buy you as much time as we can, Herrera decided. If it doesn't work, we say fuck it and make a run for the back, and we'll worry about transport later. There was a murmur in the affirmative, and Choi nodded, rubbing his hands together to psych himself up. Okay, the corporal continued. We make a perimeter around the truck. Weapons hot, but only fire when it becomes necessary. As soon as that first shot fires, we're going to be the bell of the ball. Choi, when you get it started up, everybody pile into the back and you haul ass to the rear of the stores. First batch of trucks you see, we get to work. Greer, you'll be on pickup duty. Greer nodded. I'll handle it, he said. But where are we getting the truck keys from? A lot of these stores keep the keys in the back office in case of an emergency, Herrera replied. We get in, find them, and move out. The interstate is due north of here. First two trucks take the inner loop, other two take the outer. CB Channel 8, and we'll make the call on where to block the road based on conditions. He paused looking at his team. Ready? At their affirmative, he said. Let's move. The corporal led the group outside, everyone with their assault rifles at the ready save for Choi. They raced across the street, looking both ways and seeing a smattering of zombies in the road a ways down. When they hit the shopping centre lot, they raced for the truck. There were a few dozen zombies within sight, straight ahead and several stores up. Gilbert and Greer kept them in their sights, coming around the side of the truck. Herrera and Eason turned to the right, looking down the other row of stores, seeing an alarming number of ghouls there, easily a hundred strong with the closest being only fifteen yards away. Steady, Herrera said quietly. Don't shoot until they move towards us. Both men kept their aim true, waiting for the moment. Choi tried to open the driver's side door, but it was locked. He tried the passenger side, but it was locked too. So he pulled out his metal baton and gave the corner of the window a hard strike shattering the glass. At the noise, the closest zombie to the corporal whirled around and stared at them, staggering forward. Don't shoot! I'll take it out, Herrera whispered, and pulled his knife, inching towards the ghoul. Choi unlocked the truck and then slid over to the driver's side, opening the door to duck down beneath the dash. As Herrera approached the zombie, it let out an excited moan, which gained the attention of several more ten yards behind it. In turn, they began to moan and shamble towards the truck, setting off a chain reaction. The corporal gulped, adrenaline spiking. Start shooting! Start shooting! He cried, and raised his weapon. 
He hit the closest ghoul in the face at point-blank range, dropping it. He and Eason began firing single shots, hitting the creatures one by one, but barely putting a dent in the horde. Gilbert and Greer stood fast, keeping a close eye on the zombies in the distance as they, too, began working their way towards the truck. As the fire intensified behind them, Gilbert clenched his jaw. "'How's it going, Troy?' he barked. "'A lot better if you stop bothering me!' his teammate yelled from below the dashboard. His speech was muffled by the flashlight between his teeth as he stared intently at the wiring. He picked up and chose the wires carefully, finally shaking his head and thinking, "'Fuck it!' He stripped two of them and sparked them together, relieved as the engine came to life. He tied them together, the engine purring. He dropped the flashlight and yelled, Everybody in! The firing continued as the four soldiers backed up to the truck and then clambered into the bed. Greer smacked the roof of the cab once they were clear. We're in! Let's move! He bellowed. Choi popped the truck into gear and raced away, just as the horde reached them. A few zombies made a mad grab but missed as the vehicle sped away from their outstretched hands. They drove around the back of the stores, racing down the street in search of trucks. It wasn't long before they encountered six of them sitting at the giant loading dock for the supercenter. Choi put the truck in park and hopped out. Greer, you're up, he said. Gilbert, on me, Herrera said as he hit the pavement. You two, start getting those trucks opened up and keep watch. We might have company soon. Everyone got in position as the corporal ran up to the back door. They got ready and threw it open before rushing inside, flashlights and guns pointed forward. Herrera caught a glimpse of a couple zombies wandering about. He quickly aimed and fired, knocking them out. The soldiers stood quietly for a moment, waiting to hear moans, but nothing came. They scanned the loading dock for the office. Got it, Gilbert said, and rushed over to the small room. He burst in as Herrera stayed at the door, keeping watch. He heard the doors to the store opening up slowly, putting him on high alert. Hold up, I hear something, he hissed into the room and Gilbert froze in his rummaging. The corporal stepped away from the office to get a better view of the doors. He shone the flashlight in that direction and saw half a dozen zombies pouring through. He immediately raised his weapon and fired. Find those keys, Gilbert! He barked, shooting more ghouls, striking them with great accuracy, adrenaline pounding in his ears. Got em! Gilbert yelled, emerging from the office with the ring in his hand. Herrera fired off a few more rounds and they raced to the back door slamming it shut and securing it. Find the trucks that match these and let's hit the road, he said as Gilbert distributed the keys. The soldiers all went to work, taking more time than Herrera was comfortable with locating the correct trucks. Finally, all four were inside cabs, starting them up and switching to Channel 8 on the CB. Okay, listen up, Herrera said into the radio. I'm out first. Eason, you're with me, and we're taking the inner loop. Gilbert, you and Choi are on the outer. Head west onto the bridge. We're going to go for at least a thousand yards. The further we can get, the better, because it'll give us room to expand this blockade later. Now let's roll out! He jammed the truck into gear and it lurched forward, taking a moment to get it moving smoothly. The rest of the trucks followed him out into a rumbling convoy. As they made the turn onto the road to head north, several of the zombies from the shopping center parking lot poured onto the road. Herrera moved a little to the side to avoid the bulk of them, but still managed to crush a handful under his tires, bringing a smile to his face. There was little resistance to the interstate, with the trucker tandems making their respective turns onto the proper interstate loops, smashing into a few straggler creatures as they went. The interstate was mostly empty, with a few broken-down cars. The corporal was amazed at the lack of debris everywhere. Is it just me, or is this interstate eerily creepy? he asked into the radio. Choi crackled through. The airport here is a major hub, so if anybody coming out of Austin was flying international, it would have spread here quickly, he replied. Doesn't look like a lot of people had time to react. Maybe, Gilbert cut in, or maybe it could have been aliens. There was some light laughter across the radio. Aliens? Choi scoffed. Really, man, don't tell me you believe in that nonsense. Dude. We're driving trucks so we can block off a bridge to prevent the living dead from getting through, Gilbert replied. All bets are off at this point. Eason chuckled and added, Man's got a point. The playful banter cut short as Herrera caught a frightening glimpse, forcing everyone to slam on the brakes. 
There were thousands of zombies on either side of the bridge, all slowly making their way across. Holy mother of God, Choi breathed. How far out are we, Corporal? Eason asked. Herrera swallowed hard, mouth dry. Far enough, he replied. Let's block it off. The four trucks did their best to stretch across the entire four lanes on either side of the bridge, with one truck resting against the barrier and the other doing the same on the opposite side, doubling up in the centre. When in position, the men got out of their vehicles and stood in silence, seeing the mass of creatures headed towards them. Greer eventually snapped them out of it by honking the horn. Come on, he urged. If there's this many on this side, there could be a whole hell of a lot more on the other. Herrera and Eason exchanged a concerned glance before turning to hitch a ride back. Before he went, the corporal pulled out his handgun and fired several rounds into the large wheels of the barricade truck. As the air seeped out of them, they lowered another foot. Shots went off on the other side as Gilbert caught on to what he was doing. What was that for? Eason asked, scratching the back of his head. Herrera shook his head. Some of these things may climb under, he replied. Don't want to make it easy for them. Gilbert and Choi approached the gap between the bridges, which was only a few feet wide. They hopped up and jumped over the short gap, meeting up with the others. They clambered up into the truck bed and Eason slapped the roof, prompting Greer to turn it around and head back towards the shopping centre. Herrera watched through the gap in the trucks as the mass of rotting flesh came ever closer. Chapter 11 Dixon, Ayers, and Hurst finished setting up the torches for the reinforcement's arrival. Hurst scrawled across the patio door with a permanent marker. What do you think? he asked, taking a step back. Dixon looked at the message. Up the road, through the woods, and hurry, cause we got shit to do. Straight to the point, he said with a chuckle. I like it. Ayers furrowed his brow. What if they send a higher up? he asked. They might not like that. Get real, Dixon scoffed, rolling his eyes. Why in the world would they send anyone of importance on this suicide mission? Hey now, I'm... Ayers replied, holding up a hand and then paused. Well, yeah, you're right. The soldiers shared a dark laugh at their expendability, and then froze at the sound of gunfire in the distance. You hear that? Dixon asked. Hurst nodded. Sounds like somebody's panicking a bit. They really need to tone it down, unless they want to draw a crowd, Ayers said. The shots intensified, multiple guns going off in three round bursts. The trio shared a concerned look and then took off running. We gotta get to the line. Dixon said as they hopped off of the deck and sprinted as hard as they could back to the tree line. As they ran, they saw a few of the other men that had been fortifying the gaps between houses. What the hell is going on up there? One soldier asked. Trouble, Dixon barked. Move it! The two soldiers joined them and all five raced towards the woods, quickly hopping the fence and tearing through the trees to the other side. When they reached the clearing, they skidded to a stop, frozen in horror at the scene. Three men at the car barricade at the top of the road fired as rapidly as they could into a dense mass of ghouls that were quickly reaching the cars. A fourth soldier stood three houses back, standing in the gap and firing single shots at an unseen enemy. You two, help him, Dixon barked, motioning to the fourth man. Ayers, Hurst, on me! The group reached towards the fight, and he hoped that the situation at the top of the road was manageable. The hope faded the closer he got. The schoolyard horde had made its way to their doorstep. Hundreds of creatures moaning and writhing desperately, wanting the fresh meat just out of reach. They were ten yards away from the cars, and in enough numbers to break the barricade. As the trio reached it, two of the soldiers ran dry and had to reload. Dixon motioned wildly, and Ayers and Hurst rushed over to pick up their slack, sending round after round into the mass. How many rounds have you got left? Dixon asked. One of the soldiers shook his head. Two full mags! Dixon chewed his lip as he stared out over the densely packed horde, easily hundreds strong. They wouldn't have enough ammo to take them out. We gotta reinforce the barricade, he said. The soldier gaped at him. How? Dixon turned his rifle into single-shot mode and walked up to the zombies at the front of the line, carefully firing. The zombie slumped down on the hood of the car, providing an undead brick. Single shots. Drop them at the cars, he said. The soldier shook his head. 
but they'll just keep pushing. And with dead weight in front, it'll slow them down, Dixon replied, which is what we need until we can come up with a plan. The soldier nodded and started running up and down the line, firing single rounds into zombie heads. Dixon helped out, and the other four on the line sprung to action. As they went, a torrent of gunfire erupted behind them. Dixon turned and spotted the trio by the houses fighting a three-front war. A few zombies had broken through at the first house, as well as two houses across the street, a few yards down from each other. "'Hurst! Y'all hold the line!' he cried, and then tore off towards the others, who were firing in all directions at the dozens of zombies pouring onto the street. He flipped his weapon into three-round burst, knowing he had to take a chance as the ghouls grew closer and closer to his men. He stopped about fifteen yards from the closest group across the street. He opened fire, sending several bursts down range, clipping several in the head and knocking others to the ground with the force of the shots. Dixon continued firing wildly as more zombies emerged from between the houses. The makeshift barricades not able to stem the tide as another group shambled out from a different house. He fired off the rest of the bullets in his mag and quickly reloaded, noting that he only had two more in reserve. He looked up and saw about sixty zombies in the road, facing the woods. Dixon looked over at the trio of soldiers who were not fighting back to back, firing in different directions, in danger of becoming overwhelmed. "'Back to the safe house!' he screamed, and the trio of soldiers began to retreat, continually firing the whole way. They sprayed and sprayed, hitting several targets in the head, but mostly in the upper torso. They broke off when they reached Dixon, and the four of them ran for the house on the corner. He looked at the cars, seeing them begin to move in a few spots due to the weight of the horde, watching helplessly as Ayers and Hurst concentrated their fire on that spot. Just as they reached the house, gunfire erupted from behind them, startling Dixon. He turned to see several men emerging from the tree line, taking aim and firing at the zombies in the streets. We got reinforcements! Dixon yelled in excitement. Everybody to the side! The soldiers broke from their position, moving to either side of the street, taking up positions by the houses to avoid the crossfire. They took aim, firing in a way that didn't endanger their reinforcements. The next few minutes were filled with the deafening symphony of gunfire, bodies dropping in the street, and a couple dozen reinforcement troops quickly moving in. As they approached the line, a gruff man began barking out orders. Dixon recognized Sergeant Kipling from his tall, bearded frame. You men, shore up that line, he bellowed. I'm inspecting that line in five minutes, so it damn well better be secure. The men rushed off and started firing, thinning out the horde. Kipling stood in the middle of the road, looking side to side at the soldiers who had taken cover. Who's in charge here? the sergeant demanded. Dixon emerged, heading over briskly. Private Dixon, sir. Private? Kipling asked, raising an eyebrow. What the hell happened to your sergeant? Died in the jump, the younger man explained. Corporal Herrera is up north blocking off the bridges, which meant this fell to us. The sergeant looked around the makeshift safe zone before looking back at the eight other men who had rallied behind him. He nodded in approval. I was ready to rip you a new one for that message on the door, he began, but seeing as how a bunch of privates pulled this off, I'm inclined to give you a pass. Dixon nodded, giving Hurst the side eye. I appreciate that, sergeant. Save your appreciation, Kipling snapped. You got capable men here, and more on the way. Tell me what else needs to be done so we can get it going. The private straightened. We set up here because the initial school target was completely overrun, he explained and motioned to the horde. Of course they eventually found us, but we were able to stitch something together. Only have one house on the corner there cleared as a fallback, but the others are secure. Outstanding, Kipling replied. We're going to shore this area up, and when the next group gets in, we're going to take that school. Dixon nodded. Yes, sir, he replied. Where do you want us? The sergeant looked around at the carnage in the street and grinned. I want you boys in the safe house for the next thirty, he declared. Get some chow and recharge. Thank you, sir, Dixon replied with a relieved smile and waved to his team. Come on, boys. You heard the sergeant. It's dinner time. Chapter 12 The two trucks sped along the interstate towards the eastern bridge, which was significantly shorter than the western one. Herrera concentrated on the road, feeling the bumps as he ran over the occasional zombie. 
He finally spotted a sign reading Bridge, One Mile, and pulled up his CB radio. One mile, fellas, he said. Stay sharp, and let's get this done. He glanced into the rearview mirror, seeing Greer in the pickup truck a few hundred yards back, swerving to avoid the zombies on the road. He looked back at the road, startled by one of the horns on the other side of the interstate going off. He slammed on the brakes along with the rest of the group when they spotted the freeway packed with zombies, not quite shoulder to shoulder, but it was damn close, and stretching as far back as they could see. About half a mile past the front edge of the horde was the start of the bridge. God damn, that's a lot of zombies, Choi said through the radio. Eason crackled through. Can we set the blockade up here and call it a day? Hang tight, everybody, Herrera instructed, and looked around, staring down the interstate at the gentle slope leading to the neighborhoods on either side of the highway. If we don't block it off, we're going to get overrun, he muttered to himself. He rolled down his window and motioned for Greer to come up, and the pickup came to a stop right beside his window. The private slid out his window, sitting on the sill to talk to Herrera over the roof. That's a hell of a mess there, he said. The corporal nodded. Yep, which is why you need to fall back, he said. To where? Greer asked. I need you to get down to Dixon's group if you can, Herrera instructed. If not, get as far south as you can and find a safe spot to wait on them to move up. Greer swallowed hard, staring up at him with anxious eyes. But what in the hell are you going to do? he asked. Herrera hesitated, taking a deep breath. We're going to block this bridge come hell or high water, he replied. When you make contact with Dixon's squad, you're going to need to rally some troops to come get us off this bridge. Greer nodded, lips pursed and jaw clenched. Go now, the corporal said, and above all, be safe, because otherwise nobody's going to know that we're here. Greer gave him a thumbs up and then slipped back into the driver's seat. He made a quick three-point turn and sped off. Hey, where in the fuck is Greer going? Choi demanded. He's our ride. Wait, Greer is leaving? Eason came through. What's going on? Everybody shut up, Herrera barked and then waited to make sure everyone was quiet. Now, we have to block this bridge, he said firmly. If we don't, this whole island is going to be at the risk of being overrun. So it's either we face it now, when we have a chance to stop it, or we fuck over not just us, but the entire mission. There were a few moments of radio silence as his words sunk in. Okay, that's great and all, Choi finally said. But how in the hell are we supposed to do it? These trucks aren't going to make it too far with that dense of a horde. Herrera sucked his lip for a moment. We do it the only way we can, he said. Put the pedal to the metal and get as far onto the bridge as we can. Then what? Eason asked. We sit back and wait for reinforcements, Gilbert replied. Eason groaned. Fucking hell. When your truck starts slowing down, do what you can to angle it on the bridge, Herrera instructed. It isn't going to be perfect, but we're going to do what we can. Everybody ready? He didn't get a vocal response. Instead, the truck horns blared in unison, bringing a smile to his face at the bravery of his team. Let's hit it, he cried, and all four trucks hit the gas gaining speed as they approached the horde. Herrera was nearly at sixty miles per hour when they smacked into the mass. The truck immediately lurched forward, losing speed as zombies splattered into the front grill. Soon after, the road grew bumpy as the wheels rolled over the fallen ghouls. Herrera glanced over to the right, seeing Choi's truck experiencing the same level of bumping. He refocused on the front, seeing that the bridge was only another hundred yards away. However, the truck was really slowing down, barely cracking twenty miles per hour. Come on, girl, come on, Herrera urged. You can do it. He floored the accelerator, gaining just a small bit of speed that allowed him to get to the edge of the bridge. He grabbed the CB. Troy, make a hard left just after to get on the bridge, but let me pass first, he said. We're not making it much further. Heard, Troy replied and the corporal gripped the steering wheel tight, holding the truck steady as he hit the bridge. When he made it about twenty yards in, he pulled the truck hard to the right, coming to rest on the concrete barrier. He looked out the side mirror, seeing that the truck was at an angle, blocking most of the road. Gonna have to do, he muttered, and watched Choi, who was doing a good job of getting his own truck into position, leaving only a small gap for the zombies to work their way through. How am I looking, Corporal? 
Choi asked. Herrera shook his head. Good as we're going to get, he replied. What about the gap? Choi asked. We have enough ammo. We can create a zombie barrier once the sun comes up, and we can aim better, Herrera replied. Choi laughed. Be like shooting zombies in a barrel, he said. I love. Oh, shit! A loud crash boomed from the other side of the bridge, and Herrera watched as one of the trucks slid on its side, laying across the two lanes. Several zombies flailed in the wheel wells. Shit! They must have jammed it up, he grunted, and watched helplessly as the zombies pounded against the windshield. He pulled his rifle and tried to aim through the window, but couldn't get a good enough shot without potentially shattering the glass. Whose truck was that? he demanded, but there was just silence. Somebody answer me! It was Eason's, Gilbert replied quickly. I'm on it. Herrera watched as Gilbert moved his truck into position, grinding it up against the back of the fallen truck and getting into a decent position that blocked off the majority of the bridge. A few seconds later the windshield went flying and Gilbert climbed out on top of the hood. He jumped to the back of the fallen truck and raced down it towards the other cab. He leapt over the few-foot gap and slid down the front of the truck. He looked down at the front windshield, seeing it was cracked and only being held shut by Eason's feet pressed against it. Gilbert quickly took out his rifle and began firing straight down, clipping several zombies on the top of the head and dropping them. He knocked on the passenger side window, motioning for his comrade to cover his eyes before smashing it in with the butt of his rifle. Can you move? Gilbert demanded. Eason nodded jerkily. In theory, yeah, he replied. But as soon as I do, these things are going to bust through. We'll get you out of here before that happens, Gilbert said firmly. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to hit these fuckers one more time, then reach in. When I do that, you move like your ass is on fire and take my hand. Eason nodded as he strained against the weight of the ghouls. Gilbert quickly hopped up, putting his rifle into three-round burst and taking aim. He squeezed the trigger four times in rapid succession, and then tossed it to the side and reached inside the cab. Let's go! he cried, and Eason reached up. Gilbert pulled as hard as he could while his comrade kicked off of the seat. The dead zombies at the glass bought him a precious few seconds, allowing him to get above the windshield before it crashed into the driver's seat. As Eason collapsed on top of the truck, Gilbert leaned over him. You okay? he asked. Eason nodded jerkily. Yeah, just bruising up a bit. Come on, Gilbert said, helping him to his feet. Let's get over to my truck. They hopped over to the still-standing big rig and climbed into the cab. Eason propped his feet up on the dash, taking a well-needed break and Gilbert settled into the driver's seat. "'Gilbert, you copy?' Herrera asked through the radio. "'You too okay?' Gilbert picked up the radio and raised it to his mouth. "'Yeah, we're good, Corporal,' he replied. "'How's life on the other side of the bridge?' "'We're alive and kicking, but still have a bit of work to do once the sun comes up,' came the reply. Gilbert nodded. "'Won't be that difficult to get things squared away,' he replied. "'All in all,' I'd say we did a pretty good job holding these things off. I think you're right, Herrera replied, and then took a deep breath. And for what it's worth, you did a good job today. Gilbert heard the reluctance in the corporal's voice, and he couldn't help but laugh. Let me guess. Still haven't made amends? he asked. Herrera chuckled. Hell no, not by a long shot, he replied. That's fair, I suppose, Gilbert admitted. Keep this up through the rest of the conflict, however, and we can talk, Herrera said. Gilbert sat up straighter. Rest of the conflict, he asked. You mean we aren't done after this? Being a soldier is for life, the corporal replied, feigning shock. Didn't anybody tell you that? Gilbert chuckled. Pretty sure the only thing the recruitment guy told me was that if I signed that piece of paper, it would get me out of my hometown, he said. I mean, Herrera drawled. He wasn't wrong. No, no, he was not, Gilbert agreed. Well, you boys get rested up, the corporal said. When the sun gets finished rising, we'll figure out all we need to do to secure this bridge. Good with that, Gilbert replied. Herrera tossed down the CB and propped his feet up, taking a deep breath. He stared down the bridge to the east, looking over thousands of undead heads all struggling to get to him. A few minutes later the sun began to peek up over the horizon, creating a beautiful view over an ugly landscape. He tried to reconcile those two things meeting in the middle, 
knowing that this was just another day in the apocalypse. The End Up next, Corporal Bretz leads a daring mission to block off the interstate to the north of downtown in Seattle, Part 3. <laughs>